Hey there guys and gals, it's Dante Ferrigno again at Ferrigno Freedom Channel. Welcome back. I'm so glad to have you here watching again today. I just want to be able to say thank you to all you folks who keep coming back and watching my channel. It was really nice to see a big increase in numbers on the past two videos and I have you to thank for that because I appreciate you watching. Uh, this is Sam back here. He's uh, joining me again today as usual. He just loves it on that little pad right there. Although sometimes he gets hot and wants to lay on the cool tile floor. But you know, I didn't come here to talk about dogs and me today. I came here to check out this video. You know, after Thanksgiving, my little uh, faux pas eating some pieces of pie after going carnivore all week long or the four days that I'm fast feasting. And then I was going to begin my three day fast and decided to have some dessert on Thanksgiving Day. And it is carrying with me even today. What is today? Today is Wednesday. And I am still feeling sluggish when I wake up in the morning. I mean, I just, I feel like my body is tired. And it has been really hard this past week ever since I had that sugar. And, you know, that should have definitely gotten out of my system by now. But, you know, as far as uh, blood glucose coming down afterward, but I noticed that my blood glucose numbers are higher than they normally were, especially for a few days afterward. I was staying out of ketosis a lot more than I normally would while I'm fasting or even while when, once I got back onto eating again. Now, my ketosis has been okay yesterday. I was out of ketosis when I got up this morning, but it was shortly after the dawn effect had probably raised up my glucose level because my glucose had already dropped down to about 79 this morning. But I'm going to tell you, it has been like a train wreck on my body ever since I ate that stuff. And my body's just not used to having sugar anymore. And that's because I am on a carnivore way of eating. And I specifically only eat lion diet, which is a ruminant meat, water and salt diet only. I have had occasionally had eggs, but I haven't had any. I don't remember the last time I had eggs, but it's something that I've reincorporated after over a year and a half of eating this way because I was looking for some of the nutrients that are available in egg yolks that aren't necessarily as high in, in other ruminant animals. And uh, I don't eat fish because I'm allergic to fish, for one, but also because I've been sticking with lion diet because of the healing it's brought from my body. But I would like to check out this video by a... Actually, this is on Dr. Chatterjee Clip's channel, but it's a video that f looks like it features do Dr. Robert Lustig. Yeah, Dr. Robert Lustig's in the title. You may never eat sugar again after watching this. Now, I read a book by Dr. Lustig not too long ago called Metabolical. Excellent book. I definitely recommend you go out and check it out if you want to get an idea of what we're up against when it comes to food, the food industry, and taking care of our health, and even a little bit of the uh, health care industry. So let's take a look at this video. It's 17 minutes long, so I'm going to try to keep my comments to a minimum so that this video doesn't take an hour and a half. But uh, let's go ahead and roll this. I'm going to go ahead and bring up my screen here. Quick little caveat message to throw in here too. You're going to notice some lighting changes as I go between the part where they're speaking and the part where I'm speaking. That's because I had an audio problem. I was not recording the system audio on my computer when I was watching the first time. But I wanted to keep my original reaction comments rather than record a whole new video because that was my initial reaction and I want you to get it as close to the way that I did it the first time. The reactions you may see me do facially during the part where they're speaking are as close to exactly what I did the first time. But you're going to notice Sam flipping backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards when I go between them. And uh, this will give me a chance to see who didn't watch this part and had to comment about how it was faked or something like that. Who knows? But anyway, enjoy the video. What are the key negatives when we consume the levels of sugar that many of us are currently consuming? Well, first of all, let's make it very clear that sugar is not the only problem in our diet. It's the big one. It's the 2000 pound gorilla in our diet, but there's other stuff too. But sugar is a particularly egregious molecule. Once upon a time, trans fats were the worst thing we consumed. Trans fats are the devil incarnate. Trans fats, the bacteria can't chew it up, which is why they put the trans fats in all right, so that you know it would last forever. You know the ten-year-old Twinkie, 
Well, the fact is our mitochondria, our little energy burning factories inside all our cells are really refurbished bacteria. We can't chew it up either. So the exact same reason for why they put the trans fats in the food is exactly why you shouldn't eat the food. Now we know that and they've come out of our diet. So now sugar is public enemy number one. So what does sugar do? And the answer is a whole bunch of bad things. The food industry says sugar is energy. Well, they're correct if you're a bomb calorimeter. If you just blow it up, if you explode it, yeah, you get four calories per gram. But we are not bomb calorimeters. Turns out that sugar actually poisons the mitochondria. Okay, it poisons it in th at three separate enzymes that are necessary for mitochondria to do their job. The first one, AMP kinase, which is the fuel gauge on the liver cell. The second one, ACADL, acyl-CoA dehydrogenase long chain, which is necessary to get fatty acids into the mitochondria to be able to oxidize them to create energy. And the third one is CPT1, carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1, which is the um, enzyme that regenerates carnitine, which is the shuttle mechanism that brings the fatty acids into the mitochondria in the first place. In other words, when you consume sugar, you are poisoning your mitochondria. You are generating less of the chemical energy that our cells get powered by called ATP. So if you're making less ATP, is that energy? It's the opposite of energy. All I can say is, is that this fits with how I've been feeling since I ate that sugar the other day. My body's not used to having it. And I've always kind of said that, you know, sugar's bad for you, but I've never really thought of it as an actual poison for the most part, except that it has all these negative effects. But now when I hear him as a doctor, a medical doctor saying that sugar literally poisons your mitochondria, the powerhouse of your cells, which is the, the foundational block of what you're made of, it is a poison. And I felt like I've been poisoned since last Thursday. I mean, it is just not worth it for me to even experiment with it. I have a lot of people on the channel that were saying, it's okay for you indulge in that once in a while. Why would I want to? It's simply a social function. It's a, it's a, uh, a manifestation of an addiction. And it's, it's something that I don't not only want, I don't need. And the, the want for it doesn't come from logic. It comes from the lizard brain. It comes from that part of me that wants me to do what I don't want to do and to not do the things I do want to do. I want to be able to rein that kind of thing in. So for a personal level, it's great that you guys are trying to be forgiving of what I did. And I'm forgiving of myself as well because I realize that I'm a flawed human being. But at the same time, I don't want to do things that make me feel crappy for days afterward. And that not only is it the, the mental side of like, gosh, why did I do that? Why did I do something that I, one, had to come here in front of you guys and tell you that I ate that garbage when I'm always encouraging you to stay away from it? But two, I had to feel this way for the past five days, six days now that I've just felt awful. Five days, I guess it is. And it's not worth it. It simply was not worth it. I could have gone the rest of the day without eating. I was completely full. There was no reason to do it other than that little devil jumped up on my shoulder and said, hey, you should have some of that. You've been good all year. You should be able to reward yourself with something. You should go ahead and enjoy it because this is homemade stuff and this is blah, blah, blah. And I decided long before anybody even brought the food around, when it comes around, I'm having some. So it's that part of me that I am trying to bring under control. It's something from the Christian side of my life that I try to keep under wraps as much as possible. I know I have a sin nature. I know I have a desire to do things that are not good for me, but those are not the things that I want to indulge in. But when I do indulge in them, I just 
move on because I know the Lord's already forgiven it. All I got to do is accept that forgiveness and have the right thinking moving forward. So I'm not beating myself up over this, but I am still feeling beaten up over it physically. So that's why I want to be able to come and talk about what eating sugar did to somebody who's used to not eating sugar now. Even though that I still have an addiction to it and a desire for it, it is not worth bringing that back into my life. Not only would it open the door for more of it to come in, which would continue to poison me and bring my body back to a state of lack of health that I was in before, but it would just be self-defeating for me mentally, for my goals moving forward, for my thoughts of taking care of my family. It's just not worth it. So when you consume sugar, you are actually inhibiting your body's energy production. Can you think of a chemical that inhibits your mitochondria and reduces ATP production? Cyanide. 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 Cyanide does that. Okay. Sugar and cyanide do the same thing. Now, obviously, not as severely. Okay. You know, cyanide parts per million keel over and die on the spot. With sugar, you know, it's in the parts per thousand and you don't keel over on the spot, but you feel lousy and over time it's going to take its toll. But ultimately, if you're inhibiting your mitochondria, you are poisoning your body. And we now have the data to show how that occurs. So here's my question to you and your audience. Before he asked that question, I also want to state this is one of the reasons why I started this fasting experiment that I've been doing. I'm, I'm coming up on my sixth week of doing three days fasting, four days feasting. I'm in the middle of my feasting part for right now. When I say feasting, I mean, I had one steak on Monday, I think it was. And then yesterday I had two uh, w roughly one and a half pound steaks. So I had a lot yesterday. And then today I've had a one and a half, one pound, one ounce ribeyes. So I guess that would be about a pound and a half or a little more. I feel full. I'm probably going to make it through the day because I've been adding this Wagyu beef tallow to my steak this week and checking my numbers. My numbers seem to be coming back to normal. That tallow is so wonderful. I know it's got a monounsaturated fat level that's higher than regular tallow, but I just wanted to give it a try. And I got to say, it is pretty spectacular and it melts like soft butter on the steak. It is just, it's fantastic. But um, I watched Dr. Baker talking about that specific tallow, as a matter of fact, after a few people had mentioned that it was not as healthy as the regular tallow. And he's like, yeah, it's fine to cook with. So, I mean... Uh, I tend to take a, this particular doctor's advice over a lot of other people's thoughts on the matter, but I do know that I would like to stick to the healthier fats. It's just been a fun experiment trying the, the Wagyu beef tallow. I don't know that it's going to be a regular thing, but man, is it good. But again, the reason I'm doing this thing with the fasting is because I found out that ketosis is more than just fat being converted into an energy source that your cells can use and then being expelled from your body through your urine so that you're actually converting your fat into waste material. But also the fact that ketones can get into your cell structure, even if you're insulin resistant. And I don't know that I'm insulin resistant. I think I'm far more insulin sensitive now than I was before I started this way of eating. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time, I've noticed that sometimes it takes me quite a while to start clearing blood glucose after I eat, which is, granted, going to happen when you're eating meat. It's going to take longer for it to clear your stomach and cl start going through your intestines than other foods will. So it takes longer to start dropping off than, say, a regular meal would have. But I wanted to make sure that I was getting the energy into my cells so that the mitochondria that for 48 years before I started eating this way were suffering clearly based on the way I looked and the way I felt and the way my health was all out of whack before this way of eating. That's what I wanted to be able to do is rebuild that mitochondria and the ketones are able to get into those cellular structures despite insulin not telling glucose to go in 
it's able to get in there and help that mitochondria heal itself and repair itself and to begin to be the powerhouse for those cells again so that I can have overall better health. All right, let's get to Dr. Lustig's question now. Sugar is in virtually all ultra-processed foods and ultra-processed foods are now 56% of the UK diet and the uh, amount of sugar that Brits eat 62% of it is found in the ultra processed food category. Wow. So my question to you and your audience is, is ultra processed food food? It's not. My view is that it's not really. I, w I would say no, but I know to many people that is super controversial, um, which we're definitely going to talk about. But yeah, on a straight answer, I would say no, depends on your definition, I guess, because it's energy, okay. it's got some calories in it, which we consume in our mouth that enable us on one level to, to sort of, I guess you're saying it's actually uh, reducing the energy production, the sugar within it anyway. But yeah, on one level, it sustains people and they can actually get on with their days, at least in the short term anyway. Well, you have to know what the definition of food is. So if, if, I, if I had my Webster's Dictionary right here, right now, um, you, you guys, you know, in the UK probably don't use Webster's, you probably have something else. But if I pulled it off the shelf, it would say that the definition of food is the following, and I have no problem with this definition. Substrate that contributes to either the growth or burning of an organism. That's the definition. I have no problem with that definition. It's a fine definition. All right. Substrate that contributes to either the growth or burning of an organism. So we've just talked about burning. Sugar does not contribute to the burning of an organism. It actually inhibits the burning of an organism. And Dr. Kevin Hall at the NIH did a study where he showed that when you give people ultra processed food, they burn less and gain more weight when everything else is controlled for compared yeah. to the same diet in real food. Did this in 2019. So ultra processed food does not contribute to burning. So now let's go to growth. Does ultra processed food contribute to growth? My colleague, Dr. Efrat Monsenigo Ornan, who is the uh, chairman of the Department of Nutrition at Hebrew University, Jerusalem, uh, just published three papers in bone research showing that ultra processed food actually inhibits skeletal growth, inhibits the ability of bones to increase in length and in width. And in addition, we know from the Nutrinet Santé study and many other studies that in fact, what sugar does is it feeds cancer cells, it hijacks growth. So sugar, doesn't contribute to burning, inhibits it, doesn't contribute to uh, uh, growth, inhibits it, or hijacks it. So I pose the question to you again, Ranga. Is ultra-processed food food? I'll go with my original answer, which is no. That is right. It is no. <laughs> ding, ding. That's right. But the point is that the food industry you know, refuses to go there. The populace refuses to go there. The governments refuse to go there. And ultimately, it comes down to whether or not you're going to refuse to go there in the sense that every time you spend money on ultra processed food, on the junk stuff that they feed us and call food, you're voting for more of that. You know, we talk about the importance of voting in this country, and some of us lately may have some reason to even feel like that's in jeopardy. I'm not going to go on to that subject right now, but I will say one thing. When you spend your money, every time you spend a dollar on anything, you're voting for whatever you spend that money on. So when you invest your money, when you vote for things that you don't believe in, that you would wish to see not be in existence or to be removed from your life or society, when you spend money on those things, 
You're voting against your own common sense. You're voting against your own conscience when you do that. And it hurts me every time I see a mother or even my wife buy some fast food item for the boys because they're asking for it. I'm like, it it doesn't matter. And by the way, thankfully, Katie said to me last night, I think I'm going to go back onto a carnivore way of eating because I'm starting to feel really sluggish. You know, she just turned 40 and she's really starting to think about what her health is going to be like as she's getting older. So I'm hoping it's going to take this time because I haven't done anything to push her in that direction except make her eggs and bacon and steaks every day that I can make her something so she'll have something good to eat. Even though I know she's eating some junk in between, I'm trying to get her real food as much as possible, but I'm not pushing her. I'm not asking her what she ate throughout the day. Although sometimes she'll come and tell me, yeah, I ate some of this or I drank some of that. But I'm just glad I don't see ginger ale in the house all the time. I don't see sodas in the house anymore. I don't see a lot of fruit juices and things that I knew she was doing that were high in sugar. <clears throat> She's stayed away from beer for the most part. So, I mean, it's it's really been fantastic seeing my leading the way in this health approach to my life has changed her view on a lot of things. But to also be able to see her wanting to get on board with that is wonderful. But the next thing we got to do is set an example for our kids. We can't buy this stuff for ourselves, and we certainly shouldn't be buying it for them. It's bad enough her grandmother's going to do it, and her aunts are going to do it, and her uncles and her cousins and everybody else that's going to eat all the garbage they're going to eat. I just don't want to be contributing to that. And I also, at the same time, don't want to condemn her for doing something that has been socially acceptable by the mass amount of society for many, many years, but we've got to start to draw a line on what are we going to invest in? What are we going to put our money toward? Are we going to vote for these companies that don't care for us, that want to give us the cheapest quality food they can give us, that don't care if it's got pesticides in it, that don't care if it's got glyphosate or glyphosate, whatever Roundup is in it, because they have to use that to kill wheat and oats, and then they put it in all of our cereals. That I mean, that that stuff doesn't come out of there that easily. They're genetically modifying things so that they'll resist pests more, which means they're more toxic. So all your vegetables are already hard to be healthy, even if they were, you know, you raised them from seeds, unless they were heirloom seeds, which I don't know how you're going to know that until you grow something, because a lot of times they could tell you anything and just send you some seeds. And then you got their new Franken food that they've they've manufactured. We got to do something. We got to do something to fight against what's going on because it's it's like this massive machine between government, healthcare, and and the food industry that is just grinding up the population. And with all the talks of depopulation enthusiasm amongst the the uh, Davos crowd and the billionaires club, it's hard not to think that there's there's reasons behind this that are even more than just the profit angle. Or maybe the profit angle is just the bonus on the side. But whatever it is, we got to take a stand. We got to take a stand for our own health. We don't have to do this for a fight against the world. We just have to do it to protect our own families. The reason I started doing Lion Diet is because I need to be here to provide for my family. And I need to encourage them and show them the right direction to go. If I'm taking the right path, I have to be able to lead by that example. And even if it takes three years for my wife to get on board with a carnivore way of eating, it's worth it, especially if I'm not beating her up over it all the time so that I wind up losing my wife in the process. I want to bring my family along on this healthy change that's come about, but I know that it's not easy. You're dealing with people with addictions to things. Sugar is addictive and I am still a sugar addict. So I know what I'm dealing with when it comes to them. I'm not going to lay down the law and force things on people who it's not going to change. It's going to take a why moment for each of the people in my family. But as long as I keep leading by example, I can make a difference there. And I love that we're covering how poisonous sugar can be because it's even more than what I thought so far. And you and I are both interested in mitigating chronic disease. 
And you are right. If you get people on a real food diet, you can mitigate virtually any and all of their chronic diseases. I completely agree. You gave a TEDx talk basically saying you can basically take away somebody's chronic disease. I used to do that in my clinic, you know, when I was practicing routinely. Yeah. But only if they changed the food. And if they didn't change the food, no amount of medicine I threw at them could make a difference. Yeah, I mean, what strikes me as a really key message is that the majority of what we're buying to feed ourselves and our families is ultra processed food, whether it's here in the UK or with you in America. And that is contributing to this tsunami of chronic ill health that we're seeing. It's pretty, you know, it's pretty alarming. But what, what I think is so key, Rob, for me is that it's so normalized now. Like it's yeah, the norm the everywhere, schools, hospitals. In fact, if you want to go down the real food route, you almost feel like a bit of a, like, you know, if you try and do it with your kids, you actually become a social outcast in, in some ways. It's, yep, and, pariah. and I think this is the problem. It's just, it's the norm. We've moved so far away from what we used to do. In fact, maybe this is a good time for you to explain what you used to do when you were eight years old, because I believe you had a granddad who lived in Brooklyn. And every Saturday you would do something, which I think beautifully yeah. illustrates this point. That's right. So yeah, um, uh, bottom line is I completely agree with you. What we've done is we've normalized it. Once upon a time, it was actually not normal to eat ultra processed food. And today it is normal. And I remember when that happened because it happened to me. It happened to me in two ways. So on Saturday afternoons, my family would go visit my grandparents who lived about, oh, I don't know, eight miles away in Brooklyn. And my grandfather would walk me down to the corner um, uh, grocery store to buy a comic book and a six and a half ounce bottle of Coca-Cola. I remember, you know, pretty much every Saturday afternoon. And that was the big treat, you know, the comic book and the Coca-Cola. That was on Ocean Avenue and Avenue N in Brooklyn. Um, you know, the fact is that that was once a week and it was six and a half ounces all right today you know children are consuming about i think 35 ounces a day um you know uh, median so they are getting about six times the amount of sugar that i did from that one coke and they're doing it every day instead of once a week in I mean, addition, that's just, can we just pause on that for a second? You're saying you had six ounces once a week, and we're assuming back then that the rest of your diet throughout the week was low in sugar, low in processed foods, sort of a real food diet? Well, my mother worked three jobs, and so I ate a lot of Swanson TV dinners when they first came out. Yeah. And I remember when they came out around 1964. You know, the, the fried chicken, the Salisbury steak. I hated that Salisbury steak. And I actually, she trained me on how to turn the oven on and how to heat them up because often she wasn't home at night. You know, so, you know, to some extent, I was a latchkey kid because my mother worked so hard. Yeah. You know, my father was in Manhattan all day. And so, you know, I basically had to sort of take care of myself. And sometimes I had to eat dinner, you know, out of the freezer. And so I remember, you know, those Swanson TV dinners and, you know, they, they, they were a problem. They're still a problem. Um, so you put the two together and that was the beginning of, you know, the, uh, shall we say, onslaught of processed food in the United States about the mid 60s. Um, then things picked up even more in 1975 when we started uh, substituting high fructose corn syrup for sucrose because it was half as uh, uh, expensive and it was homegrown. And then finally, the piece de resistance came in 1977 when uh, the McGovern Commission released its report saying that we all needed to eat less fat to try to prevent cardiovascular disease. Well, when you take the fat out of food, it tastes like cardboard. And so what did the food industry do? It basically replaced the fat with sugar 
That's why we ended up with Entenmann's fat-free cakes and, you know, and the like. And that was when the pasta craze, you know, first hit was, you know, refined carbohydrate because it yeah. was, quote, low in fat, et cetera. And, you know, now we're off to the races. And it's just exploded ever since. Is it the sugar that's inherently bad in and of itself, or is it yes. the excess amounts? I mean, or is it both, right? Because I think a lot of people might say, well, look, you know what, this never used to be a problem, right? And we, right. we would have the odd sweet treat now and again. Um, right. But so, and, and actually there's quite there's quite a few prominent scientists, as, as you're, you're well aware of, who say actually sugar's question. not a problem. Sugar's actually yeah. completely fine. Yeah, we're working on it. We're working on it. I, I, I have a bone to pick with some of those scientists and we can argue that and talk about that if you like, um, as to exactly why they say what they say. So here, here's what I can tell you. All right. There are social drinkers and there are alcoholics. Now, social drinkers can pick up a beer and put it down and they don't need one every day. Alcoholics pick up a whiskey and can't put it down and they need it three times a day, right? Yeah. Did the one beer that the social drinker drink hurt them unlikely 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 and the reason it's unlikely is because there is a what is known as a first pass effect you drink the alcohol in the beer first of all it's very low uh percentage right it's only about 3.6 percent in an um in a uh, in a beer all right and that uh is about oh 60 calories worth or so of, uh, of alcohol. And what happens is that the first pass effect, the uh, stomach and intestine metabolize that alcohol before any of it ever gets to the liver. And so the amount that actually hits the liver that could do damage is exceedingly small. And as long as you're not following up with a, a second beer and a third beer and a fourth beer and a fifth beer, you know, like can happen at the Newcastle pub, you know, you don't usually have a big problem. Right. But if you keep doing that, then that is a problem. So it's a dose dependent phenomenon. And um, your intestine is there to try to protect your liver from getting the onslaught before it will do damage. Same with sugar. No difference. It can also happen with pie on Thanksgiving Day. And I think that was where, if, maybe if I'd have just had that one piece of pumpkin pie with a little whipped cream on it, I'd have been fine. But because I followed it up with a piece of pecan pie and a piece of cherry pie, I just, I, I gave way too much for my system to be able to deal with and it overloaded me with poison. So your intestine can take a small amount of sugar that you consume and we can actually turn it into fat in the intestine. Intestinal de novo lipogenesis, the process of converting sugar to fat into VLDL in the intestine so that it will not go straight to your liver, All right? And about 10% of, the, of an initial sugar bolus will undergo intestinal DNL and therefore be diverted away from the liver and into the bloodstream as VLDL. Now, that VLDL is not great for you because it could ultimately cause heart disease, but it's protecting the liver. But if you consume past your intestine's capacity to do that, now the rest of it's going to end up in your liver. And the problem with sugar mm -hmm. in the liver is exactly the same as the problem of alcohol in the liver because it causes the exact same processes. It causes glycation, it causes oxidative stress, it causes mitochondrial dysfunction, and basically drives insulin resistance, this phenomenon that we now know is at the base of virtually all chronic metabolic diseases. Therefore, your pancreas has to make extra insulin to make the liver do its job, because now the liver's not working right, because it's been poisoned. And so insulin levels rise all over the body, and now you've got 
you know, the risk for Alzheimer's, you've got the risk for heart disease, you've got the risk for, virtu uh, for cancer, you've got the risk for virtually every other chronic metabolic disease on the plate, all because of what happened to your liver. Yeah. And fructose, that sweet molecule in sugar, basically has the same fate as alcohol. So when people say, oh, well, you know, a little sugar's fine, the answer is, um, yeah, because your intestine diverts that little bit away from the liver. As soon as you overwhelm that capacity, now your liver is right in the crosshairs. And that's when chronic disease is going to start. So that's, that's, that's really a good look at exactly what I was talking about when it comes to what happened after I overate sugar on Thanksgiving Day. And I've had some people say that it's, oh, it's all in your head. I've had some people say that it can't possibly be affecting you this long. Based on what Dr. Lustig says, it makes total sense to me. And it definitely something I'm still feeling here five days later, where six days later, where I am feeling sluggish. And it is it, yesterday was far worse than today. Thank God I'm starting to pull out of this. But all I can tell you is sugar is definitely not your friend. And it's something that I've been addicted to all my life. I grew up in the 70s and 80s where sugar was the mainstay of the morning breakfast. And we were drinking sugar and we were eating sugar. It was just a sugar party. Then you had Halloween every year. You had candy every time you went to the bank. You had candy every time you got together with your friends. And oh my goodness. My whole childhood was just full of it. And I always wondered why I was the hefty kid, the husky kid. I mean, I'm genetically predisposed to be larger anyway. I think that they call it mesomorph body style, where I, I tend to retain weight right around my waist area, right around this area. It's hard for me to get that area in. And even when I used to exercise like crazy and I was trying to eat all the healthy foods or I was starving myself to death eating salads, it still was always a struggle. But ever since I've been on carnivore and I've cut sugar out of my life and I've cut all the seed oils out of my life and all the ultra processed food is gone from my life, nothing has been better than this. Then, and I'm 51 years old and I feel better than I did when I was in my teens, all thanks to a carnivore way of eating that I am just... So grateful to have discovered, thanks to Jordan Peterson, who was helping me in other areas at the time that I started this way of eating, to mention that he was on an all-beef diet just hit me like a ton of bricks. And I thought, what is this about? And to find out all the health issues he had resolved with it and all the health issues that I had that doctors were not helping me at all with, and then to see those health issues go away as a result of this way of eating, I just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for bringing the right people into my life, for bringing the right information in front of my eyes. And I'm so glad that I was receptive to that information so that I could make a change that has saved me and has been a great benefit to my entire family and hopefully a great benefit to many of you who watch on YouTube and find encouragement from the things that I do and I say, and I review these videos and I show how I make my meals and do as many things as I can to try to encourage others to feel this good, to have this life that I have been looking for my whole life. I'm just grateful. And I'm grateful for uh, many of the people who support this channel. I recently got a, a payment from somebody. Let me see if I can find it. My phone is actually being used as the camera. My iPad is dead. Let me see if I can bring it up over here. Yeah, here it is. I got a, a PayPal from Bass Van Newland sent uh, $104.13, interesting amount, but I guess that might be for the conversion rate from wherever he was sending it from. He said, I watched your video on hair today and see how much you need to work for your massage. I'm personally one month in a carnivore diet and I am feeling so great. My mood has changed so much. I was not overweight, but my mental fitness was not great. Just want to give you some support. Lots of love. Bass Van Newland, 44 years old from the Netherlands. So that would explain why he was, uh, why, because it's coming from the Netherlands. There's probably a conversion rate when you send somebody PayPal and who's using American dollars. But, you know, I appreciate Bass because 
People like Bass and so many others have done this where they've sent me a little something through PayPal. And then, of course, I have my patrons, which I at the end of every video, I hope you'll check out my patron list. Please, you know, if you have a chance, say thank you to those people at the very least in the comments below the videos because they're what allow me to be able to afford to keep spending time doing this, to spend time away from my family. I still work a full-time job. So to spend time away from my family doing this when I'm already working 40 hours a week, it's, it's a cost on me, but it's worth it because you guys help make up for what I'm losing in the time that I'm doing it, and I'm able to help so many other people find out about this way of eating, about the carnivore way of eating, about lion diet that I specifically do, and hopefully find more and more people turning their lives around and stop voting for all these companies by giving their money to them that are going to support the killing of our own selves, ultimately, when we continue to eat food that is not food, food that is poison. And I hope this motivates you to at least share this video with somebody who doesn't have any idea about what they're doing to themselves or their family because we've normalized eating poison. And it's just, it's got to start somewhere it's got to start with people spreading the news because there's no financial reason to do this as far as compared to what the drug industry and the food industry is making and the government is making off of all this. There's, there's no way we can compare what telling people to eat healthy, natural food. There's nowhere to make enough money off of doing that to fight that. So it's going to have to be us sharing information and knowledge with each other that's going to change what's going on. Well, that's all I got for this one, guys. I know you've stayed here for a while on this one. I appreciate you, and I'll see you next time. Be sure to leave some comments in the in the comments section if you have any questions for me. I do my best to answer all the comments that I get, and you guys take care. If we pay extra, could we maybe get some grease or fat?